Yes, the Ontario PC party has seen better days. It's been out of power for more than a decade and hasn't won a seat in Ontario's capital city for four consecutive general elections. That's right, folks. Zero for 92 in the 416. But Ontario history is replete with examples of leaders who looked like the longest of long shots before an election, only to win next time out. So one of these two could be Ontario's next premier, thus our interest in having them come to TVO for this last debate before the PC party picks its next leader. And with that, we welcome, in alphabetical order, Patrick Brown, the MP for Barrie, and Christine Elliott, the MPP for Whitby, Oshawa. And it's great to have you two here at TVO, your first time here. Great to be on your show. Nice to welcome you back, Christine great Elliott. To be back. As I often find myself having to do these days, I gotta do a, f uh, a little full disclosure before we start here. My wife is a volunteer advisor on healthcare policy to the Christine Elliott campaign, so we put that on the table at the beginning. And Patrick Brown has been good enough to invite me to play in his charity hockey game a couple of times in the past. You raised money for the Royal Victoria Hospital in Barrie, and I have participated in that. So now everybody knows everything. And with that, here we go. Again, in alphabetical order. Why are you a better choice than she is to lead this party right now? I think our party needs a reset. The gang that's been running our party for the last few elections, whether it's faith-based funding, 100,000 job cuts, it's been a top-down approach. I think we need a fresh start. I think we need to uh, look at uh, the approach the federal party has taken, reaching out to new Canadians, reaching out to young people, reaching out to professional associations, being less confrontational with the broader public sector, being a, a party of practical and pragmatic ideas, uh, and, and I can bring that fresh start. You know, the party establishment certainly isn't supporting me. I'm not going to owe them any favours, uh, and uh, frankly, I can actually bring real change to the party that we so desperately need. Why are you a better choice? Well, I think it's really important that we show a new tone and a direction for our party because after four successive election losses, people really aren't even tuning in to what we have to say. And I believe that I'm the right candidate because I offer three things. One is I have the experience outside of politics. We know we're going to inherit a dire economic situation after the next election or by 2018. And I have the experience both in practicing law and uh, working in the ba banking sector for a number of years to do that. But I also bring a, a message that I, is resonating with people across the province, which is we go back to our roots. We are fiscally responsible as progressive conservatives, but the reason is so that we can be socially compassionate. And that is resonating with people who voted for us last time, but also people who are looking for an alternative to the Liberals. But the third reason is, of course, I have a seat, and we don't have a lot of time to get ready for the next election. We need to hit the ground running. And I have nine years of experience in provincial politics. I'm ready to get going May 11th. Let's pick that apart. She does have more experience than you do in something outside politics. Is that a problem for you? Well, you know, I, I think it's actually an advantage that I, I don't wear any of the baggage of the last campaigns, wasn't involved in the last uh, disaster. And, and frankly, you know, I practice law too. Uh, I was the chair of the city of budget, the city of Barrie's uh, budget. I was the finance chair. Uh, for how long? In, uh, I was on city council for five years, chaired the budget for two years, uh, and frankly, I have the longest history of elected experience. I've uh, been in elected office now for almost 15 years. But I think her point is you don't have any experience outside politics, no quote unquote real life experience. Is that fair? Well, I, I disagree. You know, I've uh, certainly uh, practicing law uh, in in Barrie, uh, practicing uh, when I worked at uh, Magna gave me. Uh, real life experience, but you know, if if we want simply people who have the same experience that we've had before, uh, it's more of the same old, same old. What we need is change, and uh, everyone at Queens Park was saying that everything was going to be okay. The Liberals were going to mess up, and we'd beat them. A and the reality is, we can't simply rest on them messing up. They did mess up, but because our party was stuck in the same old ways, we lost. I am challenging the conventional wisdom. I am saying, you want to win in the city of Toronto, you want to win the next election, you actually have to be present. You have to reach out. You have to, whether it's engaging with new Canadians or young people or professional associations. You know, a lot's been made of the fact that we sold 41,000 memberships. The way we did that is we said, we're not going to depend on the same old ways. We're actually going to look at ways to expand the party from every walk of life, from every corner of this province. One of the things that his side has said about your side of the debate is that he doesn't have any tie at all to that promise that Tim Hudak, your former leader, made to fire 100,000 people during the last election campaign. That's a fair point, isn't it? No, it isn't a fair point. I didn't have anything to do with that decision uh, with respect to the 100,000 jobs. I found out about it the same time that everybody else found out about it, 
through the media. So there's no question we need to change the process uh, by which we select policies in the next election. Did you find out about that through sure. the media? I did. I did. The, you were the and deputy so leader at the time. I didn't know anything about it because I was not involved in the campaign team. I couldn't even tell you all the people that were on the campaign team because I was not involved in it whatsoever. When you found out about it, what did you do about it? I immediately called the campaign headquarters and asked to see the rest of the, uh, the policy rollout because we didn't know as caucus members. We didn't know what else was coming. So that was when we all got very upset because we had been told that there weren't going to be any surprises, that, uh, that the policies were going to be based on uh, the million jobs plan that we put forward before, and that had any of us in caucus known about it, we would have been up in arms about it. I don't want to spend too much time fighting ancient history here, but, but I think how you have both reacted to uh, surprises or issues that have come up politically in the past and how you react to those uh, speaks to what kind of leaders you potentially will be. So I guess the, que the emerging question from that is, was that policy too wrong-headed or too honest? I think it was wrong-headed. I think that uh, we could have made the uh, decisions uh, with respect to the civil service without f frightening people. We could have done it through attrition and program review. But the reality was that we made that pl pronouncement about the 100,000 jobs, and that became several million jobs. We've got to stop uh, bringing forward policies that way and communicating them terribly. There's a lot of work that we need to do, but just saying that we need change for the sake of change isn't the way we need to do it. Obviously, we need to fix the way we develop policies, but we have loyal members, grassroots supporters, who have done everything they can to keep this party going and to allow us to win the next election. So, Patrick Brown, I'm here's the knock I hear about you. An MP for almost a decade, never been in cabinet, never chaired a committee, never been a parliamentary secretary, and yet you think you can go from that to the second most important job in Canadian politics. Uh, why do you think you're ready for this kind of promotion? Well, you know, I can tell you the, the role that I've been able to play in Ottawa, I've been honored by. Uh, not everyone can be in cabinet. I understand the geographical uh, requirements that are required of a prime minister. Uh, but I can tell you that when the prime minister asked me to chair the GTA caucus, he told me that this is one of the most important roles because this is going to be uh, the battleground for the next election and that whether we win or lose seats in the GTA is going to affect whether we have a majority government and I can tell you I have taken that uh, trust uh, with enthusiasm and you know for the last number of years I've been attending almost every function I can whether it's with cultural communities whether it's with stakeholders in Toronto um, and you know, the reality is if you look at the biggest contrast between the PC party of Ontario and the federal PC party is the PC party of Ontario got wiped out in urban Ontario, got wiped out in the GTA, where the federal party, we have won seats, whether it's in Scarborough or Willowdale or throughout Peel, it, you know, it was, it was the key to our success. That is true. Does he have a leg up on you insofar as he has links to these cultural communities that no one in your party at the moment appears to have? We actually do have some good links, but there's no question that we need to make them stronger. And the reality is there's whole groups of people that aren't even listening to us right now. We still have a huge gender gap. There's a lot of women that aren't voting for us. Young people aren't voting for us. They don't see anything in our party to, uh, to bring them together and to get excited about our party. And of course, new Canadians as well. So we need to reach out to them to continue to build that. I'm building what I call the big blue tent and being inclusive and making sure that everyone that shares our progressive conservative values is welcome to join them. And I've been able to build that coalition where I've got the support of Premier Davis on the one hand, Mayor McCallion, Robin Doug Ford, uh, many of the majority of our MPPs, and several dozen MPs on my side. Some people would say the Ford's endorsement is a double-edged sword. Are you sure you want to be trumpeting that? I think it's really important that we don't draw distinctions between who we want to be members of the party. We're all progressive conservatives. We all have a perspective. And we all need to make sure that we get together under that big blue tent because that's the only way we're going to win next time. And is, that's key. Is Patrick Brown a progressive conservative? Uh, you'd have to ask Patrick. I'm going to uh, ask him, but I'm asking you first. <sighs> I think that some of the, uh, the things that Patrick has talked about um, lately are not what I would call progressive conservative. Like I would what? say his stance on uh, the sex ed curriculum, for example. I've heard two things from Patrick. One is he's against the curriculum entirely. That's what I heard him say in his telephone town hall meeting last night. And I've otherwise heard that, no, some parts of it are okay. So I really don't know. I'd, I'd really like to ask Patrick that question. Where do you stand on that? Well, I, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, answer. Am I a conservative? Absolutely. I'm a proud progressive conservative. Uh, but I would, 
I'd say this, you know, there's some in our party right now who are saying the only way to beat the liberals is to mimic the liberals, to be liberal light. And I, I can tell you, Steve, if you look at history, whenever we've tried to be liberal light, the voters always pick the authentic liberal. You know, I, I have to say on, on, on the issue of sex education curriculum, I realize Christine has um, attacked my position on this. Uh, attack me for attending the rally uh, well, at, at Queen's Park, she's and, the and, and I'll say very clearly, uh, I attended that rally, um, I spoke against the curriculum, because I believe, um, although there may be some worthy elements on, on, um, on mental health, uh, my concern with the curriculum was the promised consultation did not happen, and frankly, if I'm going to if I want to look at education today, I want to see in our primary grades the focus being on reading, writing, and mathematics. Everybody wants that, but, but that's really not what the issue is. The issue is about sex ed and how much you support what the government has put mm -hmm. forward. So how much of yeah. the, what the government has put so, forward do you and endorse? And so I, I would have voted against the curriculum if it came up at Queen's Park. Uh, this, the promised consultation did not happen. Uh, and, and I have to say, and I've said this all around the province, uh, that you know I, I trust families to teach values and I trust the school system to teach science and mathematics and but not sex ed we, we have adequate sex education right now for the most sense if you want to update things on mental health then I'm I'm comfortable with that um, but I have to tell you um, you know if you look at our most of the conservatives I've talked to around the province if you look at my federal colleagues um, and just for example, on the weekend, you know, Jason Kenney was speaking out against the sex edu education curriculum. Leaders in our party, um, and, and the fact that you have attacked us, you, you referred to Monty McNaught and myself as not being, representing a modern, a modern PC party. I have to say, a lot of conservatives across the province feel this massive push to the left, this push to become a liberal light party. Um, what is the point of doing this campaign? What is the point of door knocking and volunteering and raising funds if we simply want to replicate the liberals. We can win as conservatives. We can win and have the courage of our convictions. But I guess the, the original question was, is there a progressive-ism to your progressive conservatism, or is it just a label for you? No, I'm proud to be a progressive conservative, but obviously this leadership is a choice between a liberal light version of the party and those that believe that we can win as conservatives. You want to speak to this liberal light business? I would totally disagree with that. I think we are proud progressive conservatives and that's what people of Ontario where they're sitting for the most part they want to have a government that's fiscally responsible of course because you can't do anything else without that but you also need to show that you're socially compassionate I have a history of 20 years in the volunteer sector before I got elected as MPP that's why I actually ran in the first place is to may be able to be a voice for those people that don't have a voice to help the families that have children with autism and other special needs to help our frail elderly seniors get the home care and long-term care services that they deserve. I don't see anything wrong with that. That's what people need. I want to address the real problems that people are facing. And certainly Premier Davis and his government uh, did very well for many, many years running on exactly those same principles. Those are true progressive conservative principles, and I'll stand by them each and every time. His, his uh, if I read between the lines here, he thinks you're too pink. He thinks yes. you're too much on the left-hand side of the party and not conservative enough. Fair knock? No, it isn't. No, of course not. I'm a progressive conservative means being fiscally responsible and socially compassionate. And I think that what we've done in the last 10 years or so is we've only focused on the fiscal side of things. And that comes across as a very cold economic message. People say, you just want to slash and burn. Of course, of course we don't want to do that. We want to let people know that we are progressive, that we do care about people, that we are compassionate. And that's the only way we're going to win the next election. If we keep going on the same old hard right message that we had in the last two elections, we will never win. Never win. Let's look at the other side of the coin, which is I hear about your campaign that now that the third candidate, Monty McNaughton, has dropped out, much of his support, which was based in the evangelical community, has gone to you. The social conservatives, I am told, are with you. The question for you is, um, not that there's anything illegal about this, there's certainly not, but there are some conservatives obviously who are uncomfortable at the notion that the socially conservative part of the big blue tent um, has too much influence over you. Well, let me say this, if you look at our, our, our coalition around the province of people from every walk of life, um, it's very similar to the federal conservative coalition. It is, um, it is we have public sector activists, we have new Canadians, Ooh. we have young people. What public sector activists well, do you have? You know, I'll, I'll give you an example. I think this is actually one of the unique differences between the, the campaigns. Um, at my campaign launch, I had 
the firefighters union speaking, the police union, and the nurses union speaking at my campaign launch. Their speeches are at votepatrickbrown.ca. And the fact that they all vote liberal, Patrick Brown, you know that. Not in Barry, Steve. I can oh, not tell in you. Barry. Okay. Um, I, I can tell you. The rest of the province, they I'm, all vote liberal. And maybe they did in the last election, and that's why we need to change. Because I can tell you, on my campaigns in Barry, uh, it's been the police and the firefighters and the nurses that have been my volunteers, have been my door knockers, have been the ones putting up my signs. Okay. And if you look around the province, whether it is in Hamilton or London, it was those organizations that were selling memberships for me. And and here's why. Where the old PC party, the establishment of the party, wouldn't sit down and meet with these groups, I've always believed in an open door approach. And I'll give you an example. When I sat down with the police and talked to them, what are your biggest concerns? They brought up the issue of mental health and the fact that 40% of the OPP calls last year were mental health calls. You underfund mental health, you pay more elsewhere. When I sat down with the nurses, they talked to me about their concerns of long-term care shortages. Okay, but are you too in the pockets of social conservatives? That's one of the things that many people in the big blue tent are concerned about. I, you know, absolutely not. My, my approach to politics is just be pragmatic. And what I dislike about the way the party used to be run, they, they said you have to fit in an ideological compartment. What my, what my basis is, is if an idea makes friends for Ontario, I don't care if it comes from an NDP, from a liberal, from a social conservative, from a social libertarian, if it makes sense for Ontario, I'll support it. There's no monopoly on good ideas. And the way the party was run before, I'll be honest, the fact that we voted against the last budget, announced we're going to vote against it without even reading it, is insincere. I want us to be a party that says we will consider everything. There's no more ideological compartments because I think if you go out and spend time with families like I have around Ontario, you talk to regular voters, they will tell you they don't care about your, your political jersey. They don't care what, what political persuasion you come from. The only thing they care about is how you're going to enhance their quality of life, how are you going to create jobs and make Ontario a destination for investment. Okay, and me, that's what I've been talking about around Ontario. Let me try this. I, I normally never ask uh, personal questions on this program because I think you're all entitled to a private life. But um, things happen in people's private lives that inform their judgments as potential leaders. And I want to know, I think it's okay to ask, what significant experiences have happened in your personal lives that would inform your judgments that you would be required to make every day if you were the Premier of Ontario? Christine Elliott. Uh, well, I would say two things. Uh, one was the um, very serious illness of one of my children when he was only 16 months of age. He contracted encephalitis and we nearly lost him twice. So that gave me a whole new perspective on life, on how difficult things are for many families of Ontario. And being a parent myself, I, I know what kind of lives people lead and they're difficult. I want to make things better for people in Ontario, both economically and socially. And secondly, I would say it was the death of my husband uh, last year that I could have uh, run federally for his seat. Uh, that would have been an easier path for me. But I am very committed to provincial issues, uh, health care, education, making sure that we have a strong economy. And that's why I'm deciding to stay uh, with the provincial party. I'm deeply committed to it. And that's the party I want to lead. Patrick Brown. Well, you know, I guess there'd be two examples as well that uh, I, I say normally your, your personal life shouldn't dictate public policy. I guess there's been, you know, two, two cases where it, it probably has. Um, you know, my, my grandfather on my father's side of the family passed away of cancer and um, ever since that point I've sort of made, you know, fundraising for the Cancer Center my, one of my passions. I know you've participated in it. And, and the other um, occasion uh, that affected me quite profoundly was I, I lived with my grandparents on my um, mother's side of the family. Uh, for a period in Barrie and was very close with them. And my uh, grandmother, Edna Tascona, um, got Alzheimer's uh, while I was living with her. I remember the doctor telling me that it was the saddest way to see a loved one uh, pass away. And so obviously seeing that happen to her um, hit me pretty hard. Um, and so, you know, I, I made that one of my passions in, in Ottawa. We set up a neurological disorders committee to study all neurological disorders. We made recommendations uh, to the government that were actually were approved by all the political parties. Um, and you know, certainly if I was Premier of Ontario, one of the areas that I would love to act more uh, energetically on would be on neurological disorders. And specifically the fact that if you look at the Rising Tide report from the Alzheimer's Society, it, we don't have an effective plan to deal with, with an aging population and the growing rates of dementia. Uh, let me do one brief follow up with you. And that is, again, there's nothing wrong with it, it's not illegal, but I hear people when I go to Conservative Party events talk about this. You've never married, you have no kids. That's an issue for some people. Tell them why it shouldn't be. 
Well, I don't think there's any singular, you know, family experience in this in this province. You know, I I do want to get married one day. I do want to have kids. Frankly, I you know I've got. My, my one grandparent remaining is my 100-year-old uh, grandmother living here in Toronto, and every time she sees me, she promises, she reminds me that I promised her I'd have kids before I was 40s. Um, but, you know, I have a very close-knit uh, family. I've got sisters, uh, nephews, uh, parents, un aunts and uncles that play a really big part in my life, um, and um, you know, certainly they've, they've helped shape who I am. Okay. Let's talk uh, some more uh, hard-headed issues here. You gave a speech the other day at the Canadian Club of Toronto in which you railed against the, well, maybe railed against is too strong. You said you were angry about the fact that uh, the current government wants to sell off 60% of Hydro One, which is the, uh, the poles and wires. That's the transmission company that gets the electricity that turns the lights on in the studio. Uh, you know, previous conservative governments wanted to sell off the whole of Hydro One. They're offering to sell off 60% of it, take the money, put it towards transit, put it towards deficit reduction, whatever. What's wrong with that? Well, philosophically, I don't have a problem selling off some of these assets if they make sense and they're a good deal for taxpayers. But in this particular instance, I think it's a very bad idea uh, because it's like selling the house but keeping the mortgage. The, the government's going to sell off 60% of hydro, but they're going to, that big debt is going to remain. Some of it, small amount of it's going to be paid down by this, but the majority of it's going to go into other funding. So that huge debt still remains. We also don't have a coherent energy policy in Ontario. And if I've heard one thing in all my travels over the last 10 months, it's people complaining about hydro rates, both residential consumers and, resi and industrial consumers. We have the highest industrial rate in North America. It's killing business. We've got people moving out of Ontario. So what could a lot you do of people about it? not looking at What can be done at this point about it? Where, I would, where we are? If, if I'm successful in this leadership race, I want to start on uh, right afterwards with getting an energy panel convened to develop a progressive conservative energy policy that makes sense, that's going to provide reliable and affordable power, because when we win in 2018, we need to hit the ground running. This is such a serious and pressing issue that we can't waste any time on it. So I want to have our answer up front, speak to the people of Ontario about it. I do think it's going to be a huge issue in the next election, and we need to be ready to have a proposal that's going to help Ontarians, both residential and industrial consumers. What's your view of you the know, sale of 60% of Hydro One? You know, I agree with much of what uh, Christine said on that point and uh, compliment her for um, raising those points at, uh, at her speech. Uh, I, too, have been complaining about the way the hydro energy file has been managed by this, this government uh, across the province. Um, you know, the reality is, uh, well, first of all, let me, let me address the, the sale of, of Hydro One. Uh, this is a fire sale. If you look at uh, the, um, the reality is uh, we're, we are uh, selling crown assets uh, to deal with a temporary um, deficit in the budget. Uh, it's not going towards dealing with hydro debt, um, and it's uh, more, um, it's, it's, it's governing by the, by the polls that the, the Premier thinks that she needs to spend more money on transit, and frankly, she promised transit in the last election. It's just, it is, it's part of the government's spending problem. You want to have an honest conversation about energy um, in this province. The reality is the Green Energy Act was an unmitigated disaster. Um, how Hydro One has been operated, it's, it's been a monstrosity, and we have to get this under control. And the reason I say that is, and, and this story illustrates what's, what's wrong with, with uh, the, the state of hydro prices in Ontario. I was in Leamington, Ontario, visiting a high-tech greenhouse farm, 300 employees, and they told me they're going to double in size, and then they told me they're going to do it in Ohio. And I asked them why, and they said, 14 cents a kilowatt in, in Ohio, and it's 14 cents a kilowatt in Leamington, and it's 5 cents a kilowatt in Ohio. We're losing those jobs. And this government doesn't get it. This government actually issued another RFP uh, just before Christmas for another billion dollars or more of these wind turbines. So can I just be clear? We have two conservatives here who are against any privatization of Hydro One. Well, no. I yes? Correction. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't yeah. say that, but I would say it's premature right now because we haven't really developed a coherent policy. It may be something that we can take a look at at some point in the future, but not until we understand how we need to develop our, our energy policy and what's going to be the best deal for taxpayers. Yeah, and, and I'd add to that, you know, I think philosophically we, we do want more, um, more of the market conditions in, 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 in hydro, but here's the challenge is if you look at the initial report, it said a quick IPO would only benefit those that were acquiring the asset. I, and I think as progressive conservative, I think both me and Christine would say, uh, if, if you're going to do the sale, put it towards debt. So there's, you know, I, 
I would disagree with your assertion that we're, we're against the privatization. Um, I think the way this government has gone about it has not been in the best interest of the province. Okay. Are there any taxes you would consider raising to lower the deficit? Christine Elliott. No, no. In fact, I would want to reduce corporate taxes from 11.5% to 10% over three years. I think that's one of the single most important indicators for businesses looking to locate in Ontario. We need to stop the spending and not tax taxpayers any more than they already are. They're really struggling out there to the point that, it, especially in northern Ontario where they have longer, colder winters, it's becoming a heat or eat situation, paying the grocery bill or paying the, uh, the hydro bill. We need to make sure that we can make life more affordable for Ontarians because people are really having a hard time with, with everything going up. Uh, their wages aren't increasing. We need to make sure that they're protected. How much would it cost to cut the corporate income tax as much as you've suggested? It would cost about a billion dollars. Would that not make the deficit a billion dollars bigger? No, because you're going to grow the economy with that. That's what you need to do in order to stimulate the economy, make sure that we get businesses looking in Ontario, because right now they're not. You know, Kathleen Wynne and the Liberals like to say it's still the fallout from the Great Recession. Well, that was in 2008. We've moved on since that. And let's take a look at what's happening in the Western provinces. They're booming. So clearly we're doing things wrong here in Ontario. We need to get the economic fundamentals right. So we need to have low business taxes. We do need to develop that coherent energy uh, philosophy. We do need to make smart infrastructure investments that will grow the economy, not get another Liberal elected. And then we need to really work with our uh, post-secondary institutions, with businesses, to make sure that our students can be entrepreneurs and innovators, create their own business and graduate with a degree or diploma and a business. Okay, she's given me one idea on tax policy. Let's get one so, from you. So, you know, I, and Steve, I, like Christine, uh, I would not be in favor of any new uh, tax increases. As conservatives, we're, we're philosophically uh, opposed to that. Um, what I would say, though, is, and, and I realize Christine came out with her, her platform on corporate tax reductions um, for the next election. My, my position is this. Obviously, there are measures that I want to offer um, the public uh, as a conservative on, on, on tax reductions. It could be like what the Prime Minister just offered this week on reductions to small businesses, which are you know, very much the heartblood of the Canadian economy. What my concern with announcing your policy platform now is what's wrong with the party is we've had a small group at Queen's Park decide the platform. No, I hear we, you. I get that. So, but how do we judge where you are on taxes if you yeah. won't tell us anything? Well, I, I am for tax reductions and I, and, and, and I want to see some form of tax relief. But I actually, what I'm trying to say, we have to end this top-down policy. So, you know, if you look at my personal preferences, I love the targeted measures towards small businesses and the, and, and, the, and the targets towards innovation that the Prime Minister outlined. But if you want to know what my vision for Ontario is, you know, let me say let me say this, Steve. A number of weeks ago, people were asking, you know, how did what's what's this relationship with Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister uh, of India, India, and and why did he come to your your campaign rally? And I said, one of the things that he taught me when I first met him is actually very applicable to Ontario. I remember meeting him in 2009 and saying, how did you turn your state around? Because he was a chief minister, which is like a premier. He wasn't the PM when you met him first. No, he was the chief minister, uh, which, is like, which is like a premier. And I remember his advice to me was, when he told me about the revitalization of his state, he said, you need good roads to get product to marketplace, you need cheap power, and you need to cut red tape. Now, now let's compare that to Ontario today. We've got gridlock suffocating urban hubs. We have the most expensive power in North America. We have 364,000 regulations on the books uh, and with an estimated application cost of $11 billion a year. So you want to know the type of Ontario that I want to build? I want to build an Ontario where it's the easiest place to invest. When people I get look that. I, I get that, Patrick, but I still have not heard one idea from you. I, again, as let's assume 80,000 conservatives who have the right to vote for either one of the two of you are watching this right now, which is a pretty good chance that they are. If they're trying to figure out whether you are more than slogans, that you actually have something specific that you want to hang your hat on, is there one piece so, of policy you so, can tell us? So let me tell you about how you make Ontario the easy place to invest and, and policy specific. So on the on the cap and trade system, I'm against that because not, that would make it more difficult to Your invest in Your hero, Jean Charest, was in favor um, of cap and trade. Secondly... Hang on, what about that? Your hero, Jean Charest, is in, was in favor of cap well, and trade when he was Premier of Quebec. I think you're using very strong language uh, on, on the word hero. Uh, I Mentor? Was, friend? I, I was Jean Charest's youth president when he was the leader, but that doesn't mean I endorse all his policies. Um, on, on this proposed provincial uh, pension scheme, I'm against that because that would make Ontario less competitive. How do you make Ontario more competitive? 
Well, when it comes to red, cutting red tape, I would bring back the Red Tape Reduction Secretariat, which they had provincially, which cut regulations and cut red tape. I was proud to stand in the House of Commons with Tony Clement and our Federal Conservative Caucus and vote for Tony's motion that said, for every new regulation created, we'll delete an existing one. That's a policy I'd bring to Queen's Park. Ending the failed uh, Green Energy Act is a, is, a, is a policy I would bring to Queen's Park. Um, making sure that we have an emphasis on successful transportation corridors, whether that's in um, urban Ontario or the missing transportation licks in northern Ontario, that's a policy I'd bring to Queen's Park. Okay, okay. Let me jump in here because we're yeah. down to our last few minutes here. And as we do on this program, we talk mostly policy, but occasionally we talk brass knuckles politics, and I want to do some of that right now. Hillary Clinton is going to get this question a lot over the next, how long is it till the next presidential election? My goodness, we're still like a year and a half I away. I know what you're going to ask. Do you want people to vote for you just because you're a woman? No, absolutely not. I want people to vote for me because I'm a capable person, that I've had the experience needed to lead our party and to lead our province uh, over a number of years, both in business, practicing law, uh, being working for a bank, uh, but also uh, my volunteer experience, I think, comes to bear. So okay, everything but, I've done over 20 years, there, I think, is coming together. There will be lots of Conservative Party members out there who, who, who may very well think, you know what, this party's been around for 100, almost 150 years. We've never had a female leader. It's time for yeah. a female leader. I'm going to vote for it just because she's a woman. Is that okay? Whatever way I can get votes, I'm going to go for it, of course. But I think some people have said that to me, of course, because they think that would be an interesting dynamic with three female leaders. But, of course, that's not why I'm running. I'm running because I think I'm the most capable person. Okay. Patrick, the other side of the coin for you is, what are there, 27 MPPs in the uh, caucus? 28. 28. 28 MPPs in the caucus at Queen's Park. Almost all of them are with her. I think just, is it three that are with you? Uh, we're up to five now. You're up um, to five. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, uh, uh. Basically, yeah. the question remains the same, which is, if you win, how do you walk into Queen's Park the next day and look out at a caucus, the overwhelming part of which doesn't want you there? Well, I think there's been a, a number of occasions recently, if you look at the last, actually the, the last two premiers yeah, didn't have the majority support uh, uh, in, their, in their caucus. Um, I would say this. I realize the establishment of the party is not supporting my candidacy, but I can tell you in overwhelming numbers, the grassroots want their party back. And I'm even sensing in caucus that they're ready for that change. A number of the candidates, caucus members who aren't supporting me have already asked me to speak at their fundraisers. I think there's a willingness um, to, that we need change. And you know, I, I go back to this. If we keep on committing the same approach, the same mistakes we've done before, we'll find a way to blow it again. And we need a candidate who knows how to build relationships with cultural communities, who knows how to get young people involved, and who knows how to use new communication techniques to reach the broader audiences. And the fact is, you know, whether it was in Moosonee, whether it was in Scarborough, um, we were able to get huge numbers of new Ontarians involved in our party well, in a way they never did before. Tell me this, what would be so bad for the party if she won? Well, don't get me wrong, Steve. Whoever wins this leadership, uh, I'm going to be a loyal soldier for, for the party. And run for um, it? And, and if asked to run, I would run. Um, but uh, let me say this. What my concern is, is that I look at the key areas where we lost last time in northern Ontario and look at the city of Toronto. And I, I would suggest that the same approach that was employed before would continue. Uh, and how I know that is that the last nine years, as the Prime Minister's caucus chair. I've gone to, I've been the guest speaker at the Canada India Foundation, the, uh, the Tamil Starfest, the Filipino Christmas Party, um, and, and the list will go on and on. I've never seen a provincial conservative at them. And if you want more of the same, we're going to lose. Frankly, even in Whitby, I, Steve, okay. I'd say, even in Whitby, the Filipino Association, the Punjabi Association, the Tamil Association were one of the reasons we had such, that Whitby is such a competitive race in this, in this leadership, because we went out and we showed up. Okay. You can't Fli win by not showing up. Flip side of the question is, what would be so bad if he won? Uh, well, I think that uh, Patrick is, uh, represents that, uh, um, the constituency that I am concerned about, that is uh, that the social conservative uh, group within the party would take over. And I think that that's not where people want us to go. Most of the people in Ontario are in uh, center right, but not that far right. And I just don't think we will win if we go out with that kind of a position in the next campaign. Now, he has just said, which I don't think I've ever heard him say before, that if you win and you want him to run in the next Ontario election, okay. he will do so. That's what he said. He I've, said I've said it a number of times, actually. Okay, I've, only heard, well, I've never heard you say it before, but I've always assumed that if you lost, you'd, you'd run in the federal election later this year. 
Same question to you. If he yes. wins, do you commit to running three years from now for Ab him? Absolutely. Yes. You do? Yes, I'm committed to this party. Okay, our business is done. Uh, I want to thank both of you for coming in and having this debate tonight. And, uh, of course, as we say to all the candidates, good luck on May the 9th, I guess, right? May the 9th is the day we find out who wins, with voting taking place on the 3rd and the 7th. Patrick Brown, Christine Elliott, good of both of you to come into TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thanks for having us. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.